Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 294, recorded on May 24th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. Podman Desktop 1.0 was released at Red Hat Summit this week. More on the summit in a bit. Podman, as most of you know, is a Linux container engine that provides a Docker-compatible command line interface. It's also a daemonless engine, meaning it doesn't need to run as a service in the background. But one area it's lagged behind Docker was desktop tooling. And so that's why Podman desktop hitting 1.0 is a significant milestone. Red Hat describes it as a comprehensive solution that simplifies container creation, management, and deployment, obviously with a desktop UI. My first impression was is that it has a nice, modern, light feel. Uh, I think I already like it more than Docker Desktop, but I was never a big fan to begin with. I'm a little torn on these kinds of tools myself. I mean, there is a lot to like here. It's packaged in Brew and Nix, although it, that version's not quite up to date, so it's easy to get and set up on a variety of platforms. Plus, I mean, the core values are all great. Lightweight, fast, simple, open source, extensible. Those are definitely things I like in software. And I do think we need a good open source option in this space that isn't reliant on Docker. I mean, who knows what's going on or what will happen with that company and the tooling going forward. Now, that said, I'm not really sure if I'd use it day-to-day on a desktop Linux platform, At least I'm comfortable enough with the command line tooling as it is. I'd be curious to know if audience members do like these kinds of tools on desktop Linux, though. And I do think this kind of thing is important on Mac and Windows, but there, well, there's a lot more to compete with in terms of going from zero to Docker Compose just working, getting various virtual machines setting up, tying everything together. The Podman desktop docs have definitely improved and are pretty good, but you have multiple ways to configure things right now. There's not really guidance into which way is best, so you might have to know a little bit to understand the trade-offs. And you have to learn a bit about the layers going on, mess with environmental variables, add shim scripts to the system, perhaps, or know to call the right helper. And kind of most of all, I wonder if this is a little bit too late in some ways. When Docker changed their licensing, I think a lot of organizations just started paying Docker for licenses because there wasn't a great alternative if they were reliant on Docker Desktop. Now, Podman Desktop has definitely gotten a lot closer since that time, but I'm not sure if it's quite there yet unless you're really motivated to use it as an alternative. Yeah, that's a fair point. That ship may have sailed for a lot of enterprises. Not to mention, after watching Build and Red Hat Summit, I get the impression a lot of platform providers want to build this tooling themselves. And they'll, you know, just kind of eventually have it as a feature that's a bullet point on the box. But at the same time, I I do hear from audience members that are quite interested in a daemonless configuration. They like uh, Podman for a lot of reasons. And, you know, if you are kind of starting out on the infrastructure now, or if you're kind of curious about switching to Podman, I have the sense now is a good time to get on the ground floor of Podman Desktop 1.0. Reading their announcement, you really get the impression that they're going to go somewhere with this and they're going to stick with it. They say, quote, we plan to improve Podman Desktop with more capabilities to help you work with containers and facilitate the transition from containers to Kubernetes. We are also planning to extend the support of Kubernetes objects, enabling you to create, run, debug, and more easily manage all different components of your applications. You know, my worries aside, that all sounds pretty great. Uh, I'm definitely going to keep playing with Podman and Podman Desktop. And if you want to, too, you can visit podman.io to learn more and uh, maybe go check out that new Podman Desktop website. Microsoft has another Linux distribution for servers that was announced this week. The Azure Linux container host for Azure Kubernetes service. That just rolls right off the tongue, or tall chocks for short. No, okay, no, not they don't really call it that. They seem to be just referring to it as Azure Linux. Yeah, Microsoft describes this Linux host OS as, quote, a lightweight, secure, and reliable OS platform optimized for performance on Azure. The container host offers security and reliability, receives vigorous validation tests, and requires fewer security patches due to its smaller package volume. Yeah, it's what we usually hear about these container-focused 
distros. And Microsoft is framing this as a replacement for CBL Mariner, which we've covered before on the show. They say CBL was a code name for the preview version of what is now Azure Linux. So presumably they share the same base. Azure users can deploy Linux-based containers on Azure. They do it. They love it, apparently. It's very popular over there for some reason. And you can also spin up Azure virtual machines. All of that will be on the underside, on the like the host side, now Azure Linux to facilitate all of the different functionality. Yeah, reading the documentation, it looks like it's built to run on Azure virtual machines and it leverages Azure Arc-enabled Kubernetes. And of course, it integrates into all the Azure monitoring, system scanning, and governance tooling. Yeah, just all the things free software evangelists fought for years for. Codeweavers, the company behind Crossover Software and a major supporter of the Wine Project, is now employee-owned. Jeremy White, the largest shareholder and CEO for the past 27 years, has decided to step down. Jeremy wrote in the announcement, quote, As of April 12th, the company has a new shareholder, the Codeweavers Purpose Trust. This trust will become the primary owner of Codeweavers. It seems the intention is that the trust will see that the company continues to operate for the benefit of the community and staff. Jeremy also wrote in his announcement, I didn't want to sell to someone that would be focused on extracting profit from our work. So I've spent the last three years researching alternate ownership structures. I finally settled on an employee ownership trust as my choice for the company's future. Codeweaver's president, James Ramey, is now taking on the role of CEO, and Jeremy White will continue to serve as chairman of the board. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit and check out the exciting news. Linode is now part of Akamai. All the developer-friendly tools, including that beautiful cloud manager, that excellent API that's well-documented in a library in every language, and the CLI that I use to take snapshots and do all kinds of nice things like upload to object storage on the daily. All of that and more is still available to help you scale in the cloud. And now, combined with Akamai's power and global reach, they're expanding their services to offer more cloud computing resources and tools while still providing that classic, reliable, affordable, and scalable solution for users and businesses of all sizes. And as part of Akamai's global network of offerings, data centers are expanding. They're going big worldwide, giving you even more resources to help you grow your project or your business or whatever you might host. So why wait? Go experience the power of Linode now, Akamai. Go to linode.com slash land. Get that $100 in 60-day credit and learn how Linode, now Akamai, can help you scale your applications from the cloud all the way out to the tippity edge. Linode.com slash LAN. And thanks to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. Collide can help Okta users achieve 100% fleet compliance. If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log in to your cloud applications until they've fixed the problem. And the moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. It's that simple. Collide's solution ensures device compliance as part of authentication, which reduces support tickets and IT frustration while ensuring that 100% compliance. Learn more or book a demo at collide.com slash LAN. Happening as we record in Boston is the first few days of the Red Hat Summit this year, and it saw the participation of numerous developers, customers, and Red Hat partners. Representatives from all over the industry, including Intel, BP, ExxonMobil, and many others, also were there discussing how they use Red Hat products. And it was a chance for Red Hat's new CEO, Matt Hicks, fresh off a round of layoffs, to introduce himself to the community during his opening keynote. Please welcome Red Hat President and Chief Executive Officer, Matt Hicks. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Red Hat Summit 2023. 
When I think of my career in technology, it often revolves around a few very discreet and powerful moments. Moments in which the potential of technology and the realization of it became visible. Actually, not just visible, but inevitable. Matt then walked the audience through his journey in technology. I experienced the inevitability of open source the first time I compiled my own kernel. I experienced the potential of the internet working for a dot-com startup when we launched our first website. The power of distributed teams became a reality to me the first time I used Git. Edge became a reality to me when I wrote my first iPhone application. These weren't just my moments. These were moments shared by millions around the world. Millions that saw the potential and acted on it. They established technology as we know it today. And we are in one of those moments right now. And of course, that moment is AI. Yeah, AI and its integration into the various suite of Red Hat tools was a significant focus of this summit. Red Hat is calling it the IT Automation AI Revolution, and they are baking it into orchestration products. Chris Wright, Red Hat CTO, pitches it like this. Did you know that IDC predicts that by 2027, AI-enabled automation will reduce the need for manual intervention and improve service level objectives around performance, cost, and security by 70%. It's not just Red Hat either, but their parent, IBM, is rolling out Watson integration basically wherever they can, including in their Ansible Lightspeed product as described by Katie Piccarelli, Red Hat's Director of Product Marketing. Today, I'm excited to share more about Ansible Lightspeed with Watson Code Assistant and how we see it giving an all-access to automation using AI superpowers. As you heard earlier, Matt announced the forthcoming preview of what I'm about to show you today. This will initially be made available via the Ansible Visual Studio Code extension, and I have it installed here in my environment. What you see is an Ansible playbook that we're going to use to provision a cloud instance. I have used a natural language prompt in the task name, and it's as simple as pressing enter, and the code recommendation comes from Watson Code Assistant, which is a foundation model. Yeah, we essentially have a purpose-built large language model that understands Ansible and the language around infrastructure coordination. I actually, I could see how a a purpose-built language model like this could be helpful in generating templating, even stuff that's unique to your infrastructure. But all of this still feels really early days, despite how all in they all are. Um, And I don't want the listener to take away the impression that the only thing they talked about here was AI. Uh, The summit is much, much larger than that. Uh, But it definitely, it definitely was a theme. That is a good point. There's still plenty of Linux and open source around. The event's last day will be the 25th of May, and news is being made every single day. Yeah, so we'll keep an eye on that and report back if we see anything that might be useful for you to know, just like we do for the entire world of Linux and open source every single week. So don't miss an episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get every new episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. If you'd like to get this show ad-free and all the shows at Jupiter Broadcasting ad-free, get a Jupiter.Party membership now with a set-your-own price. As for us, we'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open-source news. Thanks for joining us, and that's all the news for this week. <laughs>